Hello, my name is Thomas Schneider and today is the 29th of January 2023. I want to look back at an essay I wrote about one and a half years ago for a class at the University of Cologne with Dr. Thilo Zimmermann, a course called European Integration. The essay was published on the 26th of July 2021 and it's titled Europe 2021 and the End of Fiscal Prudence. I preface it with a short quote from a song that I like. Uh, it says, When I get older, losing my hair, many years from now, will you still be sending me a valentine, birthday greetings, bottle of wine? Introduction. Compared to other key institutions of Europe, say the Parliament, the Commission, the Council or the Court of Justice, the European Central Bank, the ECB, is an institution that may be less familiar to most citizens. This is no surprise. The inane workings of national banks, which, like so many other European institutions, continue to exist in the shadows of their new European umbrella, with exclusive staff nomination processes, closed-door decision-making and obstruse fiscal instruments, have always been a mystery to most people. Bankers do not seek the limelight, and least so central bankers. Nonetheless, with the establishment of the single currency, the euro, on 1st January 2002, as the only legal form of cash tender in now 19 of the European Union's 27 member states, the ECB is perhaps the prime and only example of a European institution where power has passed from the national to the transnational level. More than any other singular step, the abolition of national currencies in favour of the single common currency should have brought to fruition Mitrani's vision of a genuine nationalisation of European production, with the abandonment of artificially protected industries, the suppression of tariffs, with the pooling of materials, of knowledge and of credit, to lower costs of production and enhance the purchasing power of the populations concerned. It is perhaps unsurprising that the ECB headquarters should be in Frankfurt, de facto cradle of continental European banking since Germany's unification and industrialization in the 19th century and seat of the Bundesbank since 1957. Nonetheless, despite the geographic continuity for Germany, this article argues that the move in the locus of power from a national to a centralized supranational European institution is structurally impacting German national government fiscal responsibility. The issue has moved into sharp focus as German state debt is rising at its fastest historical rate ever, while mid-term balanced budget accounting and prudent state economic policy seem to have gone with the wind. What are the root causes for this behavioural change in the minds of the political elite in what remains Europe's powerhouse economy and what are the likely consequences for the EU as a whole? In a second part of the essay, it will be argued that the fiscal challenges of the COVID-19 pandemic are different from a sovereign debt crisis and confused by the current ECP board with ideological and political agendas, such as greening of society at all costs by stimulating economic growth at Europe's and the world's peril. The current ECB response overrates the transitory nature of COVID-19 and overlooks real and important inflationary signs. I obviously wrote this one and a half years ago. An institutional shift. Undoubtedly, there has been an institutional shift in the relationship and international dynamics with national government agencies when the ECB became the supranational, not least in terms of nationality of its staff, central bank in 1998. The journey began with the European Council decision of 1988 and the Maastricht Treaty, passing through the three stages of European Monetary Union, known as EMU. The new relationship can perhaps be summarised as follows. Whereas before, national banks faced the same local economic situational challenges and were steeped in the same economic traditions as national government, with the introduction of the euro, a central ECB, a deliberately alliteration here, is remotely interacting with 27 national governments. Superficially and initially, the ECB would appear to have inherited the successful tenants of the widely admired Bundesbank, 
often credited with a post-war German economic miracle. Foremost are political independence and the exclusive mandate to maintain price stability. As Ottmar Issing, financial strategist and former ECB directorate member, argued insistently in his 2005 speech, One Size Fits All, price stability is the single monetary policy mantra that must be enforced across the currency union as a whole. In setting interest rates, the ECB must not be distracted by local imbalances, be they wage or price development, differences in real interest rates, employment, or social costs. In today's heated debate about taking urgent action on climate change, he might as well have added envi environmental transition, Energiewende in German, and IT transition, Digitalisierung in German. All these distractors fall in the realm of politics, now the responsibility of politicians, not the ECB, whose sole remit is to maintain fiscal discipline, even if this exerts pressure on national governments to control spending and borrowing. This inflation-fighting stance, keeping interest rates high enough for profitable investment, was powerfully exemplified by the first president of the ECB, from 1998 to 2003, Wim Duesenberg, with his words, I hear, but I don't listen. A test of resolve, European sovereign debt. During the sovereign debt crisis, indirectly triggered by the collapse of Iceland's banking system in 2008, European national governments with structurally high debts and public deficits were penalised by rapidly rising interest rates on new sovereign debt, as investors demanded increasing risk premiums. Only bailout payments from the ECB and the IMF, coupled with strong austerity measures to cut public spending, prevented sovereign defaults. Fabrini observed, if the euro was adopted in the first place for preserving a European Germany, the euro crisis has brought the opposite effect, that is, the emergence of a German Europe. Politics has been substituted by macroeconomic and judicial rules, whose respect is supervised by technocratic bodies unaccountable, directly or indirectly, to European voters. This is no discredit to an independent central banker, indeed, it is a vote of confidence and trust. A vote by Greek citizens in 2015 against further austerity measures coupled with social unrest raised the risk of Greece having to exit the common currency. A year later, Britain, though never part of the euro, voted to leave the EU, completing Brexit on 31st January 2020. In 2017, a collapse of the Italian banking system due to junk loans was narrowly avoided. In response to these challenges, the ECB repeatedly instigated multi-billion euro rescue programs of bond and asset purchases, coupled with ultra-loose monetary policy and negative central bank interest rates from 2014 to stimulate lending and investment. In response to the COVID-19 pandemic, the ECB significantly expanded debt purchases by a further 750 billion euros, of which 390 billion euro take the form of non-repayable grants, not loans. Much of the money is earmarked for huge government-run, not private, infrastructure development schemes, notorious in the past for their inefficiency, cost overruns and underdelivery. It is questionable when, indeed if and if not, in what form sovereign debts will be repaid to the ECB and the citizens of Europe. A change in the German relationship. Any weakness in the ECB's resolve to enforce fiscal responsibility on member states to fight real inflation in a non-political, non-ideological manner signals trouble. It means nothing less than abandoning the successful formula espoused by Tabellini. EU policymakers, the ECB, the Commission, the majority in the Council, generally have a narrowly defined mission. Price stability. Enforcing the single market holding the prices of agricultural commodities stable. Since EU policymakers have a narrow mandate and decisions are often inspired by external and technical criteria, they can be held accountable for their behaviour despite the absence of elections. Should, however, a weak ECB court political public acceptance by supporting the ideological flavour of the day with loose monetary policy, as is currently the case, this 
again written in the past, this opens the door for national governments to abdicate responsibility for reckless spending with long-term detrimental fiscal consequences. Effectively, this triggers a reversal in actor expectations and loyalty towards the new regional centre, with decision-making passing back to local actors with their national lo loyalties. Unspoken chauvinistic attitudes may resurface even in a German finance ministry, such as the ECB is not run by Germans, runaway inflation is not our remit or our fault, and anyway, the southern Europeans have been raking up debts for years and will force communalization of their sovereign debts. So why not we now also freely make debts, instead of just paying for others? This would be a dangerous rush to the bottom. In my opinion, such psychological effects pose a systemic inflationary risk that cannot be ignored, particularly in an election year where the head of the German finance ministry is the party political candidate of the Social Democratic Party, the SPD, for next chancellor. Obviously we had those elections now. There is always the political temptation to prioritize short-term feel-good factors, not be the party pooper, bearer of bad news, and to blame others, like the ECB, as the external scapegoat, for having dodged necessary pain and being led astray at the right time. Here again something historical, why I thought COVID-19 is different, how a weak ECB and our political politicians, sorry, our politicians, failed us. This summer, the summer of 2021, consumers across Europe are quickly returning to old ways. Live entertainment, gastronomy, hotels, tourism and travel. The effects of COVID-19 on the tertiary sector were always going to be largely transient. Fundamental trends such as increasing globalization, the e-economy, remote working, home office and delivery may have received a boost through the pandemic but progress regardless, with necessary transitional pains for the economy and the labour market that are hardly free. Nonetheless, the public bill to sustain these sectors through the pandemic has not been paid but converted to mutual taxpayer debt in each country. During the COVID-19 crisis, governments, with Germany's at the fore, invested huge sums of public taxpayer money into subsidising national champions to gain an advantage for a quick post-pandemic return to cheap air travel, package holidays and the car economy. Prima facie, this was done to maintain salaries and jobs, but with the side effect that stock traders and investors, who would normally be expected to show the downside risks themselves, were off, let off the hook and handsomely rewarded. As of course were the peddlers of all kinds of financial instruments in the form of lucrative commissions. National taxmen closed their eyes to large asset price and stock market windfalls in the form of soaring valuations for the privileged and moneyed few, whereas high street banks passed on the negative interest rate policy of the ECB unencumbered by national politicians to the average saver as zero to negative interest rates in the guise of bank service fees. Denied the right to withdraw full funds in cash due to existing capital controls, citizens are ushered into electronic forms of payment with full tax verification at time of transaction. This raises questions of privacy, choice and free will. At the same time, the ECB has shown itself inept at recognizing the inflationary effect of legally convertible but unlicensed cryptocurrencies and non-fungible assets, leaving an open door for money laundering and other nefarious activities. Conclusion Tone deafness at the ECB to overheating stock, real estate and virtual currency markets are pumping up a financial bubble, whose inevitable bursting risks plunging the EU into a structural debt trap and inflationary spiral. Rapidly rising material and commodity prices, including the energy transition premium, are already resulting in declining real incomes. Wages cannot keep pace. The corona debts will likely be repaid by today's young idealistic Europeans, including from their potential inheritances and estate, with even less means to generate new and further economic growth since the population structure is relentlessly aging and reaching the limits of individual consumption. As history has shown before, this will have the long-term effect of increasing social injustice and wealth concentration 
while at the same time missing the urgent environmental challenge, reining in surplus industrial production and per capita consumption for the sake of the planet. We should be expending less energy and capital, not more. At worst, mindless depressing force in the inflationary track could cause the breakdown of the social market economy, the much um, vaunted soziale Marktwirtschaft that has been the bedrock of Germany's wealth and social stability since 1949, with unforeseeable consequences. This author argues for an urgent return at the ECB to prudent fiscal principles and wealth stewardship, even at the expense of higher bank interest rates and more measured capital investment. Over the coming years, post-Brexit Britain will be the reference against which the EU and the Euro will be measured in a holistic societal sense. Time will tell whether the tighter fiscal policy of the Bank of England and the Federal Reserve, combined with an independent international competitive financial sector and legal system relative to a weak and disorientated centralized supranational ECB and a bankrupt European banking sector, could give the Europeans a run for their money. The ECB may yet regret not reading the signs and raising interest rates in a timely manner, abandoning the ideal of fiscal prudence and giving in to politics and the market during the COVID-19 pandemic. Let us not forget that financial markets are global, that Europe's currency defences cannot match those of the United States, and that ultimately creditors claim their prizes. Well, that's what I wrote back uh, on the 27th or 26th, sorry, of July 2021. I think uh, it still holds true. Of course, we've seen a huge hike in the interest rate and we've seen a huge decrease in real incomes. Um, where to go now? I'm not sure. But anyway, I read you the old paper. Bye. <laughs>